Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Graham Chapman. <laughs> Graham, you, you, this book of yours, is, it's called A Liar's Autobiography, okay, Volume right. 7, international bestseller, even though it's not yet published, or today it's published, or tomorrow. Now, it seems to me that there's a smoke screen that you've deliberately placed over your early life. Yeah. Would I be right in assuming that? Yes, I think that'll probably be Volume 8. Volume 8 will, yeah. will reveal all. Well, can yeah. I just put some of the confusing things to you, just to find out the truth, to establish your credentials, as they say? Right. The book quotes... Born in Leamington, or rather in Stalbridge, Dorset. Leicester. Is... You're in Leicester, all right, <laughs> fine. His parents, Tim and Beryl, actually Walter, Edith and Mark, were outraged... Yes, that's so... just Walter and Edith. Walter and Edith, sorry. And Mark well, was out. Mark was out at the time. They were outraged because they had expected a black heterosexual Jew. <laughs> I think they got that one right. Did they? <laughs> No, there must be some mistake there, obviously, as well. Right. <clears throat> it was certainly true, of course, that, that you, in fact, as I said in the introduction, that you uh, became a doctor. Yes. Um, why? Ah, uh, I think because it seemed the simplest course for me at the time. Uh, uh, writing essays and doing anything artistic in school, for me, called for a little more effort. Whereas anything to do with science meant I had to learn things, and I was reasonably good at learning things. I didn't have to create anything. So it seemed simpler to do that. I was a little afraid of creating things, I think, in a sense. Really? Hmm. It's curious that when you think about what you've created since. That's what I really wanted to do, and that's what I finished up doing, I suppose. Was there, in fact, did you find uh, medicine, did you find it a, a, a good training ground for a humorist? Yes, I think it's a good training ground for anything, actually. Is it? Because yeah, you meet all sorts of people, naturally, in very strange predicaments. And, uh, you do strange things to them sometimes. Um, oh, it's great fun. What, yeah, was, the, what fun. was the strangest predicament you ever saw a human being in then? Do you mean... Um, uh, as a well, doctor? As, yes. Well, it's, it's rather embarrassing. Is it? Really, yes. Do you think it's not fit topic for... The, the one I immediately thought of was, uh, anyway. Well, so think I better of... think of another one. Mm. Yes. Um, uh, Let's think of another one. Well, actually, concerns that it's, uh, mentioned in the book, uh, it was really uh, not a patient that was, that was the bother. Uh, it was that myself and uh, my registrar, I was doing a locum at the time, for ear, nose and throat, uh, had been to the rugby club dinner the night before. And so we were a little hungover, uh, he more than I. And if you put in a mirror, the back of someone's throat and you actually touch the back of the throat sometimes the patient goes <coughs> like that and he was doing this looking down the patient's throat the patient went <coughs> and he went <coughs> <laughs> what, what could we do poor patient <laughs> how were you how were you therefore with given this this bugger how were you therefore first attracted to showbiz um I think, really, it was the uh, early radio shows. Um, I, I was an avid listener to, to radio shows like uh, Take It From Here. Um, before that, Jewel and Warris, um, Hancock, uh, uh, all sorts of radio shows. And then later, uh, when I was about 13, 14, The Goon Show, of course. Yeah. Here came a show which was not like any of the other shows. It, it didn't have the same kind of rules. It didn't have any rules. It, it didn't even like the, the medium that was putting it out, particularly. It didn't like the BBC. Wonderful. There was something that uh, I could relate to, and uh, did. And uh, I suppose that's influenced us. And uh, the Python, would you, you would see Python as a direct descendant, then, of what M Michael and, and others uh, started? Well, um, actually, Harry Seacombe was, was kind enough once to say that we, we did for, for television, not uh, what the goons had done for radio. And um, maybe we did, I don't know. Yes. What are the problems involved, though, in, in, in working? I mean, uh, the, the success of a team like the goons or Monty Python depends upon every talent being separate and, and, and therefore mm. individualistic. What is the problem involved in, in, uh, in keeping a relationship, a working relationship, among such strong-minded people? I think one of the most important things, really, is that we should all feel at all times that we we should do other things. In fact, we always have. Uh, I mean, I've always written 
uh, separately from, from Python, um, situation comedies, for instance, for Ronnie Corbett, the doctors that you were talking about earlier, the doctor scripts. Um, and we, all of us have something else which is, which is a separate part of our lives, which, which keeps our own identity satisfied, as it were, so that we don't just submerge to the group. And stops you hitting each other and things like that, because there must yes, be a mostly, problem. Yes, yeah. mostly, yeah. Yes. 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 Which problem were you talking about? About hitting each other. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what about you, Michael? Did you find this, that you had to break away to create an identity for yourself? As... No, I, uh, I st actually started in the, the West End of London with the, the chair back and the sink pump. That before I, before yes, I did the Goon right. Show, I joined the boys because we were all ex-servicemen. That was really the link. Mm. I got one of those terribly worthy researchers, came up the other day and said, Kutu Chung, I'm, I'm, I'm writing an analysis of Goon Show. The man has no sense of humor at all if you write an analysis of the Goon Show. And he said, I, I, I would like to know the single most significant social factor that gave that tremendous drive to expose some of the evils of the iconoclastic society. I said, yes, very simple, we were all pissed. <laughs> Going back to what you were saying there, raised an interesting point with you, Graham, in your career, too, about being drunk and this sort of thing. Because, yeah. uh, because you, in fact, were, were more than, than, than drunk on one occasion. You were, in fact, an alcoholic, were you? Yes, I did a lot of drinking, a great deal, a very great deal indeed, Michael, yes. You were an alcoholic. You safely say, so, yes. I did do a very great deal. Yeah, why yeah. was that, do you think? Uh, I think, well, I don't know, that really, the answer to that. Uh, deep inside, I, I think, actually, that I was insecure. I didn't really feel that I'd uh, deserved the success that I'd achieved, as it were. I think that was it. Who was laughing at that? Yes. Strange <laughs> reaction. I'll come and sort you out later on. That's right. Anyway, uh, you, you, I think that was the reason. Uh, some sort of insecurity. After all, I was the one of the group that hadn't... That I was a grammar school boy, you know. I wasn't a uh, public school. I managed to get to Cambridge, then I felt a little bit out of my depth there, perhaps. I don't know. But I always seemed to get there, never seemed to have to do a great deal of work, and yet managed, and I, I felt it was insecure, so I drank. And how much at, at, your, at your peak, so to speak, how much were you drinking? Um, four pints of gin a day. Oh. Four pints of gin a day? Yes, that's... that was only during the last month and a half or so. That's almost a sort of terminal dose, isn't it, I would think? Pretty much, pretty much, yes. Mm. Yeah. What, what, uh, what pulled you back from, from it and made you stop drinking? Because you've been drying well, up. Well, I noticed, uh, actually, that uh, it was beginning to affect my work, um, because... <laughs> <laughs> on the, uh... You mean when you remember it, it was a... <laughs> when I can remember my work, even. Um, yep, yeah, the very first day of filming of the Holy Grail, in fact, we were halfway up a mountainside in Glencoe, and I hadn't got my, uh, my daily dose. And it was seven o'clock in the morning that we left the hotel. The bar wasn't open, I hadn't realized this, hadn't gotten anything prepared the night before as I should have if I'd researched my drinking properly. Uh, and so I had DTs on the mountainside uh, while having to try and remember lines and uh, stand up, you know. It was uh, uh, then that I decided the next time that I do a job like this, I'm going to be clean for it. Uh, it's not fair to the other chaps in the group. It's not fair to me. It's not fair to what I've written. Um, that's very stupid. And um, so when I next had uh, a patch of time in which I thought I would need to, to recover, I took that patch of time and, uh, and recovered after, well, I suppose, really three days of hell. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say, how difficult was it? Uh, actually, once the decision had been made, once I'd decided to stop, it was easy, except for the, for the three days of, uh, of unpleasantness, of, um, well, having things crawling all over me and... Uh, Literally, I mean... Hallucinating it... and that sort of thing. Very can, unpleasant. Can you remember the, the, what, what you were hallucinating about? Can you? Well, one of the worst things, strangely enough, was not being able to remember whether um, I had slept or not, whether I was dreaming or whether I was awake. I didn't know. It was disorientating completely. I didn't know whether I was, um, you know, whether I had, I'd slept for six hours or whether I'd been awake dreaming. Uh, I didn't know where I was. Um, Objects uh, seemed to threaten me as well. Uh, an angle poison lamp. I remember by the bedside, you know, I would be just lying there. And yeah! <laughs> <laughs> seems that it's rather like um, W.C. Fields was always acting that part. Um, I, I was doing it for real. Um, for a short time. Then after that, um, a, a week in hospital, um, just um, cooling off on Valium. And uh, I've been fine ever since.
You, in fact, of course, too, you, you are very great friends, and you write about him lovingly, actually, mm. in, in the book with Keith Moon, yeah. who killed himself, of course, through, through drink. Well, that's right. I was, during the last year of Keith's life, he was, uh, he was attempting to dry out quite a lot. I was drying out with him. We were, in fact, involved in a mutual project. And uh, I, I saw him uh, dry out. In fact, I went to uh, his hospital bedside on a couple of occasions just after he'd had a little, um, a little uh, uh, epileptic, epileptic form, I suppose, epileptic, well, epileptic fit of some description. And um, the following withdrawal of alcohol. And uh, oh, I was, you know, I'm going to have to do that someday. I'm going to have to. But the tragic thing was, was seeing Keith go back to drinking. You see, he didn't really, actually, had never really decided to quit, to stop. And it has to come from you, I think. Yes. You have to it's watch It's your to. decision. Either you're going to live or, or not. <laughs>